Coffees are a series of conversations that we have during the year where we bring together experts to discuss issues that we think are central to the health of populations. Just to give you a sense, in uh, 2020, this is our last event of 2020, and we've had 98 speakers uh, and uh, panelists come join us in 2020, making for a really rich set of the conversations. This uh, event, which is our last one of the year, is perhaps one which I've been most looking forward to. We are here to talk about poverty, medicine, and public health. I think there is no relationship that is more clear and more important for the health of populations than is one between income, wealth, poverty, and health, health of individuals and health of populations. This event was inspired by a book written by one of our faculty, Dr. Stein, from whom you will hear in a second. The book's book broke. Patients talk about money with their doctor. It is a beautiful book. It's a beautiful, sad book. One that I think is a real critique of how the country has, has really grown to neglect poverty and how poverty affects so many millions in the United States. And it is, it was a book that was written obviously before COVID, but I think has greater salience at the time of COVID when it's something that we are all thinking about. We continue to see the enormous socioeconomic disparities that um, have been written largely uh, in the COVID era, much of that mapping on to populations of color. And all of that fundamentally is of deep concern to public health. We have today an outstanding panel of uh, people, including Dr. Stein himself, who will be discussing this, who will be discussing poverty, its role in medicine, and its role in public health. And as with all our public health conversations, I'm really excited to be here and to learn from our speakers and our panelists. We are very fortunate today that we have as our moderator, Natalia Linos. Natalia is the executive director of the Françoise Xavier Banu Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. Natalia is trained as a social epidemiologist, has previously worked in the United Nations leading work on climate change and health, served as science advisor to New York City Health Commissioner. And earlier this year, she was a candidate in Massachusetts fourth congressional district Democratic primary. Natalia is going to introduce all the speakers. Each speaker will present for a few minutes and following all presentations, there will be moderated discussion and we'll encourage audience questions and take questions from the audience. To everybody who's joining us, thank you. Thank you for making time to be part of this conversation. Thank you for your interest in the health of populations. And now it's my great privilege and honor to turn this over to Natalia. Thank you so much, Dean Galea. It is truly a pleasure to join you and uh, this amazing panel conversation. I'm gonna introduce all five of our speakers um, and then they will present one after the other. First, we will hear from Sonny Gupta, Director of Neighborhoods and Housing at the Boston Foundation. Sonny has more than 20 years of experience in the field of affordable housing with extensive knowledge of development and finance. Then we will hear from Jamila Michner, who is a professor of government at Cornell University. Jamila's research focuses on poverty, racial inequality, and public policy in the United States. We will then turn to Philemon Leptis, the executive director of Beth Israel's Bowdoin Street Health Center. Born and raised on Bowdoin Street, Philemon served as manager of community health, operations manager, and associate director prior to being appointed to executive director. Fourth, we will hear from Herminia Palacio, the president and CEO of the Guttmacher Institute. In this role, Herminia guides the Institute in fulfilling its mission to advance sexual and reproductive health and rights in the United States and globally. Prior to joining the Guttmacher Institute, Herminia served as deputy mayor for health and human services for the city of New York. Last, but certainly not least, we will hear from Boston University School of Public Health's own professor, Michael Stein. Michael has worked at the intersection of behavioral medicine and primary care. And as you heard, his most recent book, Broke, Patients Take Talk to Their Doctors About Money, served as the inspiration for today's program. I'm truly excited to moderate this conversation. You'll be able to ask questions in the chat. And after the panelists speak, we will get to that discussion part. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean Galea and Natalia. Uh, good evening. It's an honor to be here this evening with this incredible slate of distinguished speakers. I'm looking forward to hearing each of them into the discussion uh, later in the program. As the only housing person on this panel, I'd like to spend the next eight minutes or so on the intersection of poverty, housing, and health. And in particular, I want to focus on the manifestations of poverty in housing instability, 
where housing instability is both a cause and an outcome of poverty. And that's particularly true when looking at racial inequity in outcomes. So when we think about housing, one of the key metrics we use to assess housing affordability is what we call housing cost burden. That's the percentage of household income that goes towards housing costs, such as rent, mortgage, utilities. And a widely accepted standard of affordability is that it be 30%, no more than 30% of your income. So a household that's paying more than that is considered to be cost burdened. And one that's paying more than half of its income is considered severely cost burdened. What we have here in this chart is the share of households, both renters and owners, who pay more, that are cost burdened in Greater Boston. And I just want to uh, point out that these are pre-pandemic numbers. So in 2018, almost half of renters were cost burdened and almost a quarter, more than a quarter of owners were cost burdened. When you look across income bands, there's a disproportionate number of households that have lower incomes who are cost burdened and also severely cost burdened. And there are many factors that are responsible for these cost burdened households. Supply in our greater Boston region and actually nationally has not kept up with demand um, in terms of housing. Pre-pandemic, we were about 30,000 units short of housing that was needed in greater Boston. We know that wages, especially at lower, you know, lower levels, have stagnated even while at the top, we've seen an increase in um, people with high wages. Uh, and the structural imbalance is that even a household with two working adults at full employment will still be cost burdened while renting even just an average two bedroom apartment. So what does this mean in terms of um, net worth and assets and the ability to afford rents? Um, people might remember this data point that shocked us all from the Color of Wealth report in 2015, where the median net worth of a white household was almost $250,000, while that of a black household was $8. So in these low income cost burden households, we know that black and brown households are disproportionately represented. And while the effect of poverty is cost burdens amongst households of color, housing policy itself is the cost, cause of poverty. And these racial inequities have been embedded in housing long before 19. We had redlining, racialized zoning, segregation, predatory lending, urban renewal, exclusions in the New Deal and the GI Bill. And these are just some examples of the public policies that produced racial disparities that even till today permeate housing policy. Uh, when you think about home ownership, it's the primary tool for wealth building in this country. And um, home ownership has failed to benefit black homeowners because of this long history of unequal treatment. And that's just something that we um, are mindful of and looking to see, uh, looking to correct. Even amongst renters, poverty results in severe cost burdens that make households extremely vulnerable to housing instability. Um, if you look at the uh, data on the left of this slide, black and Latinx households much more likely to have fallen behind on rent. And this is COVID data. But even prior to COVID, um, the graphic on the right that shows eviction filings disproportionately amongst renters of, of color and also amongst communities of color. So what does this mean for health? How does unaffordability, cost burdens impact health? The first is that when households are unable to pay rent, they end up moving frequently and it results in uh, housing instability that's really hard to, um, to ameliorate and, and mitigate. Frequent moves uh, have been linked to gaps in insurance coverage amongst children, not having a usual source of care or primary caregiver, um, postponing the need for medical care and, and medications, increased emergency department usage, increased hospitalizations, it's also associated with poor health amongst young children. Sometimes the increase of drugs before the age of eight to 16, higher emotional, social emotional problems amongst children, increased pregnancy. Um, I don't need to be telling this audience, I know um, that many of you are familiar with all of these impacts. 
Families also end up spending less on other needs. Um, there's a saying that says, um, rent eats first. And so rent being a household and how housing costs being amongst the uh, portion of a household's income expenditure, um, there's very little left to pay for other things such as healthy eating, preventive care, um, uh, and um, other ways to keep a family healthy. Being unable to pay rent also causes mental health issues and, uh, and negative mental health outcomes. Um, there are studies that have shown that people who are just behind on rent or mortgage payments or who are approaching foreclosure were more likely to meet the criteria for depression, a higher likelihood to um, have poor health on self-reported surveys, even more uh, likely to have a, an anxiety attack. And unaffordability also means that people will look to rent or purchase whatever housing they can afford. Often this is housing that's maintained of lower quality, um, maybe in neighborhoods with fewer opportunities. And we know that poor housing is associated with health and high rate, uh, with respiratory health issues, high rates of asthma, um, lead poisoning is a big uh, health issue, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And there are many um, relationships. I know that uh, other speakers will also be talking about the relationship between uh, neighborhood physical environments and health. And then there's just a growing body of evidence linking this, these impacts on health and unaffordability and poor quality housing. Not only are um, hospitals starting to invest in housing and related interventions because of this, but they're also looking to play a bigger role um, in health policy and health systems. And what we in the housing world would like to see is population level interventions from um, healthcare institutions and um, other players. Um, I wanted to share some of the data from COVID. So that a lot of our um, in, a, in, in inequalities, inequities are a lot of our issues related to housing were pre-COVID and what COVID has done is um, explode them in our faces. Uh, the COVID infection rates, severity of illness, even death um, are almost uh, caused by poverty and exacerbated by housing issues where we've seen seen that communities such as Chelsea, Lawrence, a lot of our communities of color where there are primarily uh, low-income households living in overcrowded homes are seeing higher rates of COVID-19 infections and also illness. And following those patterns um, has very much been um, the issues in a lot of our uh, communities of color. What we learned from our partners working in Chelsea, um, so the quote here on the right is from Rafael Maris, the executive director of the Neighborhood Developers, which is the Community Development Corporation in Chelsea, was that their developments um, owned and operated by the CDC, sorry, the different CDC, um, uh, was a fraction of uh, the COVID had where, um, where uh, infection rates were a fraction of um, the COVID infection rates in the larger community. And a lot of that was related to the property management and residence services that were being offered by the neighborhood developers, access to PPEs and coming in and um, helping with food service and food takeout uh, and a lot of other services. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just sort of getting used to this clicker. Um, a lot of our social housing and cost burdens are um, the Section 8 rental voucher program, uh, access to home ownership for low-income households. But even so, while we propose these solutions, we cannot take our eye off racial equity. Section 8 and even the state's rental voucher program are vital tools for housing stability. And we find that even to this day, some of the uh, discrimination continues. So the Boston Foundation funded a study carried out by the Suffolk Institute of um, uh, Suffolk University Law um, un, uh, College, and they did paired testing, and the testing uncovered discrimination that 
um, in the case of people with vouchers uh, in 86% of the tests, and in cases where there was a black tester and a white tester, 71% of the tests. And um, a study in Long Island uh, showed that black testers experienced discrimination in 49% of the time uh, relative to other uh, groups. So finally, just ending with what are some of the solutions that we are working on and moving forward, what are some of the areas that we can put our collective muscle behind? Uh, we want to create a racial equity framework for affordable housing, keeping our eye on those, like I said, on the very systems that have held behind certain groups in our population, Black folks, Black households, Brown households, making sure that our systems and our solutions are correcting for those racial inequities. And just in two broad buckets of one of housing stability and access and the other housing production, keeping an eye on eviction prevention, making sure that those that are hardest to reach and falling within the cracks are being supported, that there's legislation that provides protections to renters, that there are home ownership opportunities for people of color, in particular black um, households, and that even amongst renters, that there are programs and opportunities for economic mobility. There is a program called the Family Self-Sufficiency Program that allows renters to grow a portion of their income increases over time that they then have access to. Um, and also looking for ways to take rental housing off the speculative market and put it in the hands of mission-based owners. Uh, and in terms of housing production, to go back to a supply and demand issue, addressing the policies that have constricted supply and correcting for a racial equity. Zoning is one of the, the oldest tools of perpetuating discrimination and we're constantly seeking to um, do zoning reform that provides more housing opportunities for low income households and people of color. And then finally, we use research as a way to um, raise, uh, bring attention to the inequities in housing. Uh, there's so much more to talk about related to housing, poverty and health. And I look forward to doing that in the discussion that will follow each of the presentations. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Sunny, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Elaman Laptis, and I'm the executive director for Bowdoin Street Health Center. Um, I am, as we explore this topic of um, public health, medicine, and poverty, I'm hoping to be able to give you uh, an on the ground uh, description of kind of what we do at our health center in uh, Dorchester. Uh, so Bowdoin Street Health Center, we were established in 1972 by a group of residents that came together, really trying to figure out a way to provide health to our community um, in the Bowdoin Geneva area of Dorchester. And for many of you who don't know, community health centers were essentially the healthcare arm of the civil rights movement. Our mission at Bowdoin is to provide excellent, compassionate care to our patients and also to support the health of the entire community. We are a hospital licensed community health center. So essentially we are a department of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. We have over 11,500 patients uh, consisting of 43% African-American Caribbean Islanders, 40% Cape Verdean, 12% Latinx, and about 5% uh, Caucasian Vietnamese. And unfortunately, as we start to see gentrification move into our neighborhoods, we're actually starting to see a shift in uh, who we have um, as patients. Um, we do about 41,000 visits a year um, and really our services um, not only include uh, providing health care, but it does include community health programming and wellness. One area that I wanted to touch on um, specifically is our population health management and kind of what that is and what that looks like. Uh, I would say several years ago, many um, community health centers as well as um, hospitals and healthcare providers moved into what's called an accountable care organization. 
And really and truly that allowed us to peel back the layers of our population and figure out how or uh, what are the ways that we can totally uh, provide care that went beyond just providing the, the regular uh, office visits that you would typically experience. When I look at equality and equity, um, you will see on the slides that there's a huge difference. Equality is everybody getting the same level of care that they need, but in the equity component, we are setting everyone else up for success so that they get the right opportunity uh, as everyone else. Our community overview, um, as it was described in uh, my intro, I was actually born and raised literally down the street from the health center on Bowdoin Street. And we are a diverse community. Um, there's lots of resident investment and we have a strong community-based organization uh, network that is full of lots and lots of resources for our neighborhood. But we still have uh, challenges even in light of all of the resources that we have. Um, I would say one of the, the main issues that we experience is uh, community violence. Um, there's additional socioeconomic challenges, a poor education system, and it's not listed on this, but it was actually crystallized even more during the pandemic access to healthy food. In thinking about the social determinants of health, our health center tries to use our community health services or even integrate our community health opportunities into primary care, really looking at all of the social determinants and how we can respond to them by way of, of health. And you can see uh, within these, within the space of social determinants of health, the common denominator for us at our health center is community health and wellness. If we cannot take care of our patients, the community that our patients live in, that then in turn provide them with the access and the resources that they need to live healthy lives, Sorry about that. Um, we, we actually really do have to really invest in the community that we are also a part of. In terms of community health, we have um, integration and prevention, and that's all internal. So I talked earlier about our patient population or being uh, roughly over 11,000. Um, what I did not mention was that about 10% of our patient population is, is are diabetic and we have hundreds more that are pre-diabetic. And for those of you who know anything about diabetes, you will know that um, it can be prevented or delayed through healthy eating and exercising. Um, now you can imagine from a health center perspective, we are telling our patients, you need to eat healthier, you need to exercise. Uh, and basically what it boils down to is that if you don't have access to healthy food and it's not at, at within arm's reach, um, and essentially we have many bodegas in our community and it was only until I would say within the last 10 years that we had supermarkets that were closer to our immediate catchment area. Uh, so telling people to eat healthy was not um, as successful as we would have liked it to be, especially when they didn't have access to it. Um, in addition to that, we tell them to exercise. And if you think about exercise um, and the most efficient way to do that is probably to get outside and get moving in your community. But if you don't uh, feel safe in your community, you're not going to do that. And we actually noticed that a lot with our pediatric patients that parent, per, parents preferred that their kids are home and safe, even if they were sitting in front of the TV playing video games, at least, at least they knew and felt safe that they wouldn't be um, out there in the midst where they can be unfortunately caught in crossfire. One other area that I'd like to address um, that we've worked really hard on is our patient-centered medical home. It is a model that is designed to put together a number of care, um, providers that are where it keeps the patient at the center, but we all have the common goal, which is to work with our patients to keep them healthy. Uh, the other piece is our community health workers, which are an essential part of what we do at Bowdoin. You will, as you heard uh, my, uh, uh, my colleague uh, Sony talk about housing, our community health workers work with our patients on issues such as housing, food access, supporting them with, um, uh, medication that they may need in terms of getting them access 
to if there's any barriers to um, accessing their medication, um, whether it's signing them up for SNAP benefits, uh, for food access, and also um, supporting them by attending uh, different uh, appointments that they may need to go to. Um, Fitness in the City and our Wellness Center, they uh, offer programming that are specific to patient populations. It could be to our diabetic patient population. It could be to our pediatric population uh, to really hone in on the things that we can provide as a health center to introduce them to healthy lifestyles or even explore other opportunities with them. As we think about community health, our integration and prevention um, really is around violence and food access and policy systems and environmental change. Looking at each of these, these opportunities, we are definitely trying to figure out ways in which we can support our patients to, uh, a, to, to address the issues that happen in their built environment. Um, I am looking forward to answering any questions that you have about our health center and to also listening to the uh, presentations that follow me to, and hopefully, I'm hoping that this opportunity will connect the dots for all of you to understand how we address the issue of public health, uh, medicine, and poverty. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamila Michener. Uh, just to refresh your memory, I'm a professor of government at Cornell and also co-director of Cornell Center for Health Equity. I am happy to be here today and I'm happy that we're able to have this conversation. It's a really important conversation um, and one that I think is, is clear given everything that's happening with COVID-19 that's more important than ever. So today in focusing on health and poverty, I'm gonna emphasize something that we don't always talk about when we talk about health and poverty, uh, which is power. And I wanna make a case for why power matters and why we should think about power when we think about health and poverty. Um, I'm just trying to move my slide forward here. Bear with me, okay, there we go. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, just now, it's a moment like none that we've really had in, in, in recent memory, certainly, to really think closely and carefully about the relationship between poverty and health. Um, when, for example, we can observe uh, poverty in the wake of COVID-19, and it makes it clear that there's, there's a connection between what happens in the realm of public health and what happens with respect to poverty. And that, that connection is pretty complex and multifaceted. Um, and, and we see it in even just some of the basic numbers that we've seen in terms of poverty rates uh, over the course of this pandemic. And, and we could look at poverty rates hovering around 15% before the pandemic. Um, and, and, and there's a dip in March that's associated with, uh, with the CARES Act. And then we can see um, an increase over time between, between March and September, right? That increase is, is less substantial because of, the, of, because of the CARES Act, but we can see that, that without that federal intervention, we would have had even higher rates of poverty in the wake of COVID-19. And COVID-19 just provides us with one example, but there are lots of, there is lots of evidence to to suggest a broader set of connections and relationships between poverty and health, right? And it's important to understand uh, the mechanisms that explain this. And this is what social scientists spend a lot of their, their time trying to understand, right? Why is it that poverty seems to be associated with a range of different negative health outcomes? What is it that explains that linkage and that connection? Um, and we know that this, re this relationship isn't just one way. It's not just that poverty leads to poor health, um, but that poor health can lead to poverty. And so there are self-reinforcing relationships and understanding um, how those relationships operate has been a big part of what social scientists have spent their time teasing out. And some of the mechanisms that we've tended to emphasize are, for example, around health insurance. A lot of my work focuses on Medicaid. I spend quite a bit of time studying Medicaid, our, our, one of our nation's, our nation's largest public health insurance program. 
uh, that serves predominantly low income people um, and, and health insurance more generally. And we know that uh, people who are living in poverty are more likely to be underinsured, to be uninsured or to be insured via Medicaid. So we can think about how relationships to these health insurance statuses connects to actual um, health outcomes, right? Another mechanism people have focused on or many social scientists think about um, are hospitals, right? Health systems more broadly, health care institutions. And it was great to hear um, Philemon talk about what's happening at the, at the Bowdoin Street uh, Health Center and to get a sense of how institutions like that can play a role um, in structuring health outcomes for the better. Um, and also, you know, uh, uh, the kind of lack of, the, of institutions like that or the underfunding of institutions like that can help us explain negative health outcomes among people living in poverty. Um, and there's also housing, right? And so we heard from Sony. I thought that was a great presentation that really helped us to think through housing as a mechanism that explains the relationship and helps us to get to grapple with the relationship between poverty and health. And there are lots of other institutions, right? One example is prison. I teach a big undergraduate course at Cornell on prisons and, and I'm um, board chair of the Cornell Prison Education Program. So I spend time teaching inside of prisons and I spend a lot of time thinking about the relationship between prison and health. We know that people who are incarcerated are more likely prior to incarceration to be living in or near poverty. And that incarceration itself, in addition to the conditions people endure before and after incarceration are associated with worse health, right? So a range of different mechanisms at play here. And I'm not even beginning to touch on any of them. Uh, are to touch on all of them, right? To touch on the full comprehensive range of them. And, you know, we often uh, describe these different uh, mechanisms that, that help us to understand health as the social determinants of health, right? Um, and the CDC describes social determinants as the conditions in the places where people live, work, learn, and play. And these explain in part why some Americans, like Americans living in poverty, for example, um, are more um, healthy or not as healthy as other Americans or as they could be, right? And so as we think about social determinants, often the kinds of things that come into play are precisely the kinds of things that we've heard about in the presentations prior to this, right? Um, things that have to do with communities in the ways that, uh, that Philemon pointed out, things that have to do with the neighborhoods in the built environment and this larger category of economic stability, which involves uh, poverty, which is the topic that we're emphasizing and focusing on today. And if we think about the way that the CDC, for example, um, structures uh, its kind of, um, its, its perspective on, on, on health and the factors that impact health, and there's this interesting pyramid, right? And, and the factors at the top are the factors that frankly have the smallest impact. So things like clinical interventions, right? Which we may think that has a really direct proximate relationship to health and, 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 and those sorts of interventions do. But as we go down that pyramid, we see that the things that have the largest impact on health are indeed socioeconomic factors connected to these social determinants. And when we think more deeply about social determinants and we dive into social determinants, um, and we sort of define what they are, and this is another definition similar to the last, but this comes from the Kaiser Family Foundation, just to give us a sense of the range of ways we can think about social determinants. When we look at these various arenas, which again, we've already heard some details about these arenas that are relevant from the previous speakers, we really get to see the full range of potential factors that help us to grapple with the relationship between health and poverty. And that relationship is multifaceted and it's complex, but it also in many ways boils down to an inadequacy um, and a deprivation in the lives of, of, of Americans living in our near poverty across these various domains, right? Um, I'm going to focus on one aspect of the healthcare system, which is Medicaid, because I study Medicaid and think a lot about it. But I'm also going to use Medicaid as a bridge to help us think about policy and then to help us think about power, right? Um, now, Medicaid is related to and connected to poverty. You can ignore that too on the slide. It's not supposed to be there. It's, you know, typos. It happens to all of us. Medicaid is connected to poverty and related to poverty. I mean, we have lots of evidence to suggest that, right? And then lots of evidence um, to, to sort of corroborate that. This is one example of that kind of evidence. 
Um, it's a recent study, a, two, a 2019 study that looks at the impact of Medicaid on poverty rates between 2010 and 2016. And in exactly the way that this, that this graphic suggests, um, you know, what Medicaid does is as access to Medicaid um, increases, we see poverty decrease, right? And we can think about Medicaid in relationship to other kinds of patterns that aren't poverty, but are, that are related to poverty, either that are a reflection of poverty or are a cause of poverty. And so we can think about Medicaid, for example, in the context of evictions, right? Um, and this is based on data from California, but it essentially looks at um, evictions before and after the expansion of Medicaid um, in counties in California. And this is, so this is between 2008 and 2013. And counties rolled out their expansions at different times so we can look and see uh, what happens as that rollout occurs. And, and what we find is that we get fewer evictions um, as Medicaid expands, right? And we could continue to look at studies like this that show the relationship between Medicaid and a variety of outcomes that are relevant to people living in and near poverty. But Medicaid itself is structured by a broader set of policy decisions, right? So this map shows us which states have adopted the Medicaid expansion that was part and parcel of the Affordable Care Act and which states have not adopted the Medicaid expansion. And then just um, a few states that have adopted but have not yet implemented. These policy decisions that are in the hands of states, whether they're gonna adopt policies like Medicaid ex expansion, whether they're going to not adopt them, whether they're going to, how they're going to implement them. These are a whole range of policy decisions, right? That map back to the relationship between poverty and health, right? Because of the connections that I've suggested already, but that are a function of policy decisions, right? One thing I wanna note is that race is a big part of this discussion. So even though we're talking about poverty, poverty is really crucial. There's a strong relationship between poverty and race, both because people of color, especially black and Latinx populations are more likely to be living in our near poverty and because the sort of politics and policy that orients around anti-poverty efforts um, is racialized, right? Is It has racial meaning and it has racial implications. And so this map, for example, shows you the racial composition of Medicaid beneficiaries across states. And it's really striking. In at least 20, in 25 states in the US, the, the Medicaid beneficiary population is over 50% non-white. So Black, Latinx, Asian, Indigenous are multiracial, right? Um, over 50% of Medicaid beneficiaries are people of color in 25 U.S. states. And, and in many more states, that number falls between 30 and 49%. You only have eight states where Medicaid beneficiaries are fewer than 30% people of color. And so these policies, this Medicaid is an example here of a larger phenomenon, that the policies that help to structure the relationship between health and poverty are racialized, right? And that's just a factor that I want us to keep in mind as we have this conversation. But more broadly, as we talk about policy, it brings us into the realm we have to consider power. Because ultimately, what determines policy, what structures policy, what sets the contours, the boundaries, the, the, the floor and the ceiling for policy is politics. And the lifeblood of politics is power. And this is one of the reasons why power can be considered a social determinant of health. And the World Health Organization says this explicitly. And so this is my favorite definition of social determinants. And the World Health Organization tells us what we get from other uh, definitions, right? It's about where people are born, where they grow, where they live, where they work, where they age. But here is the crux. These circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money. Of course, we're talking about poverty. We recognize that as a factor power and resources at global, national, and local levels. Power. Power is at the crux and must be at the crux of our conversations about social determinants and of our conversations about the relationship between health and poverty. Because power structures the political process and the political process determines the policies, the investments, the decisions that shape the social determinants that are affecting people's lives. And and structuring their vulnerability to negative 
health outcomes, right? So power is key here. Now, one of the reasons why I think it's really important to think about power is because power gives us an entryway to thinking about change. Because when you can leverage power, you create change. And how do we create that change? Well, it's not about, um, you know, where, you know, where an intervention is targeted necessarily, but how it works, how it actually leads to change within the system, right? And that really pushes us to think big, to think about how we can change these larger structures and systems that affect the various outcomes that we're interested in understanding and talking about with relation to health, right? And so where is our focus is gonna be? What are we gonna target as we think about and brainstorm ways to change the relationship between health and poverty? Those are, that's an important question that we have to ask ourselves, right? And there are lots of choices as far as our emphasis. We can focus on individuals and we can say they need to change their behavior. They need to change their choices. They need to make um, better decisions as far as being healthy. But that's only gonna get us so far because these problems are structural, right? And so instead of focusing on individuals and how to change them when they're not actually the root cause of the inequalities that we see with respect to health outcomes, we have to think about institutions, including health systems, about communities in exactly the way that Philemon and Sony pointed out. We need to think about states and institution, institutional structures that, that, um, that affect the behavior and, and that constrain or enable states like federalism, right? And we need to obviously think about what's going on on the federal government across all of these levels. We need to be contemplating where power is located, how power operates, and how we can leverage power for change. You know, one of the things that's true is that it's tempting to sort of look at weak leverage points in a system, go for the low hanging fruit, make changes that only affect small outcomes at the margins. One of the reasons we do that often is because we just don't see the political possibilities for doing much more. And tacitly, not always explicitly, but often tacitly the way we think is, given the distribution of power in our society, we're just not going to get to the transformational change that it would take, for example, to break the relationship between health and poverty, the negative relationship between health and poverty. And so we look for ways at the margins that we can tweak because we don't believe that power is organized and distributed in a way that allows for more fundamental change, right? But that isn't a given and it, it, it need not be, and it should not be. Instead, we have to think creatively about how, how power can be adjusted and leveraged, how it can be built and expanded, how it can be distributed, where it should be located in order to create and produce the kind of change that will, um, that will be effective in making sure that people living in poverty have access to health, to a healthy life, to health care, and to all of um, the things that they need in order to achieve healthy living. You know, I want to end here uh, with a quote from one of the Medicaid beneficiaries that I've interviewed um, in, in much of the qualitative work that I do that brings me into conversation with and into the lives of Medicaid beneficiaries. And it's intentional that I end with the voice of someone who's living in poverty, someone who's embedded in many of the systems that, we, that we're spending talking about in this panel. Um, because part of what it means to think about changing and redistributing power is thinking about centering the voices of, of people like Angie. When I asked Angie what she thought about power and politics in relation to Medicaid, this is what she told me. Angie is a black woman from Michigan. She said, you know anything, anything, the poor are always who suffer the most. And you know the saying, he who has the gold makes the rule. It's most certainly true because they don't care. They don't have any, the people who make these rules and these guidelines, they don't know anyone on Medicaid. They don't have any poor people in their families. You know, they don't have, they don't care. That's why they're willing to chop so many services for the poor. That's why they're willing to, you know, make all these horrible mandates and cut services to people who really need it because they don't care. You know, they have no vested interest in caring. So politics goes into it. And the question is, how do we shift power relations so that the people who have a vested interest, the people who are most deeply affected, the people who are most vulnerable, the people who are often most exploited with the most at stake, 
can also be the people whose voices are at the center of our decision-making processes, who are shaping policy and who are affecting outcomes so that the relationship between poverty and health can disappear so that people living in their in and near poverty are just as likely to be able to live healthy lives as anyone else. Um, and ultimately so that we don't have anyone living in or near poverty. Thanks for listening today. Well, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to listen to the presentations of my co-panelists, and I really look forward to hearing uh, the presentations that follow. So I'm Erminia Palacio. I'm a president and CEO of the Guttmacher Institute, and I'm going to uh, give this talk basically from the perspective of a career sitting in multiple perches, including uh, in academic medicine, as a clinician, as a as a, a director of a health department in Texas, and uh, as deputy mayor in New York City, and now as a uh, as a leader of a um, an organization that's a think tank. As I was thinking about this presentation, I became very reflective, and I was wondering to myself and I'm hoping to prompt our discussion, which is what have we learned from our past? I had the responsibilities and I asked that question uh, really specifically as somebody who did have the responsibilities of responding to multiple uh, disasters uh, on a national and sometimes local scale. So Hurricane Katrina, I was in Harris County, I was a director at the time and had the responsibility of leading the medical branch uh, response uh, to this terrible tragedy along the Gulf Coast. We were not the impacted community, but who was impacted? It was people who were poor. Who did we receive in our shelter? We screened over 65,000 people. We uh, sheltered over 27,000 people. And as you can see here from the buses and the pictures, um, the people who couldn't get out weren't people who couldn't get out because they didn't want to get out. They were people who actually couldn't get out because they didn't have the vehicular traffic, the, the cars. They didn't have the money to hop on a plane. They didn't have the resources to be able to rent a hotel. Um, so this is one of the things that we saw in our recent history. We uh, responded to a very significant event that lasted over three weeks that required me to issue my first and thankfully last uh, health advisory that basically told people not to uh, turn their water on because they might blow up because there was methane traveling underground towards the wells of people in this rural community. Uh, this was a, a natural gas exploration event. And in Houston, there was a particular, uh, there was a particular way of describing communities that people took for granted. They were called fence line communities. And they were really communities, houses, schools, grocery stores that were abutted the, the actual fence line of basically the largest petrochemical refinery um, uh, you know, zones uh, uh, in the continental U.S. And who were these communities? They were largely people, as Jamila said, who didn't have power. They were largely people who didn't have the economic resources and for, for whom these were represented good job opportunities. But the air pollution, the water pollution, and everything that they were subjected to, because they didn't have that many choices about where they lived. Um, we are now in a second pandemic, but we had a pandemic not that long ago, which was the pandemic influenza uh, of 2009, H1N1. And uh, although much of the discussion now would make it seem that these, some of these questions uh, we've never contemplated before, we actually contemplated them quite recently. And there were very robust federal, state, and local plans. And where we were forced to think about the questions on the table right now. How are we going to prioritize uh, medications or vaccines in short supply uh, 
who's gonna get them? These are our ethical questions. They are questions that really invoke all of the issues that we've been talking about today. So we uh, talk about a past, a past during which disasters exacerbated pre-existing inequities. And who experiences these inequities? People who are poor, people who are black, brown, and indigenous uh, always bear a disproportionate share of the, of the uh, disaster, just as they bore an in uh, disproportionate share of the inequities going before the disaster. So I asked the question, what have we learned from our past? I asked that from the perspective of a primary care physician who uh, practiced for over 15 years in San Francisco at the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic was most of my clinical practice. And my clinical practice in particular was comprised uh, largely of uh, uh, black and Latino uh, and Latina men and women. We have a history of many scholarly reports and documentaries. I've just picked two here, just illustrative, but you've heard data before. We have lots of data that documents in painstaking reality, uh, the longstanding uh, health inequities experienced by communities of color be it from chronic diseases or exposure to infectious diseases. So it's a past during which there's been extensive documentation. So now I come to another question, which is, have we learned from our past? And I ask this question as someone who's become in recent days, very much more, I would say recent months, keenly fascinated by the way that history informs or doesn't inform the current frameworks that we used for action. You heard lots about social determinants of health, not accidentally, a critical uh, concept to think about the way uh, it, poverty intersects with medicine, intersects with public health. Uh, Jamila pulled up a current day quote from a patient, from a person who's experiencing these inequities. I'm gonna pull up a quote from the 1840s from uh, Dr. Ruta Verkow, who's actually known as the father of cellular pathology. This was really sort of his specialty as a physician. And yet in the 1840s, this pathologist said, medicine is a social science and the science of human beings and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. Medicine as a social science along with politics has the obligation to point out problems and to attempt to find a solution. I'm struck by the conversation that we've had today about social determinants. We've had, as I was tempted to, to you know, look at the many definitions of social determinants of health, and yet you find in the 1840s, a definition that aligns very much with the broader definition of social determinants of health and embedded in it is the politics of power that Jamila just talked about. So now I'm gonna to come to the here and now. We are at the crossroads of a confluence of historic events. Uh, including the Black Lives Matter movement, coronavirus, and economic collapse. And so my question that I hope that we will discuss and that my co-panelists have already set up for a rich discussion is not what have we done, not what, not what have we learned from the past, but really are we finally ready at this moment in time, at this inflection in history, are we finally ready to actually learn from our past? Thank you. So I am just delighted and humbled to share this session with my brilliant and 
passionate colleagues. And let me get started. Now, what, what we've heard uh, so far is that health is largely shaped by where you live and the conditions of your life, these social determinants. But for me, this is among the clearest examples. This map is a map of life expectancy of each US county. And what you'll notice is that at the dot, which is Oglala, Lakota County in South Dakota, you will have uh, folks living with the lowest in family income, $26,000, and the lowest life expectancy, 67 years in the nation. By contrast, if you go to Fairfax County, Virginia, it has among the highest life expectancies in the, and the highest median family income. The life expectancy in Fairfax County is 84 years. So context matters. It matters actually by 17 years across these two locations from South Dakota, Virginia. And that is just an absolutely stunning disparity. Now, what drives health? We've already made a list of those factors today. We've heard of education, housing, food insecurity, medical care. Uh, the causes of poor health obviously vary by population and individually, and they're likely multifactorial. They're dynamic over time and they change over the life course. But I would say that poverty shapes all of these factors, which is not to say that history and contextual factors and policy factors don't play a role in poverty. Living in a low income neighborhood affects housing and crime and government policies historically driven racial separation. Racism, of course, stays out as a peculiarly American driver of health. But I would argue that poverty is the cause of causes, the ultimate and compounding disadvantage. And from this list of causes, we naturally form a picture of material hardship from lack of access to medicine when we need it, to lack of toys and around, et cetera. Now the lives of too many Americans are very hard. Urban Institute analyzed the ability of 7,500 Americans to meet basic needs by measuring material hardships in 2018. Now that was when there was a strong economy and nearly four in 10 respondents experienced at least one material hardship listed here. Nearly a quarter faced multiple hardships. And remember, um, these are findings that illustrate the danger of assuming that a healthy economy means a contented workforce. And of course, in the United States, what we know, and these are data from COVID's time, is that poverty's material hardships has racial underpinnings. Since the summer of, of the epidemic, uh, Latinx people uh, uh, by 15 times, Blacks but six times are more likely to have the electricity or utilities sh cut off in the last two months compared to whites. Now, what I would say is that poverty is more than material hardships. Um, I'd argue from seeing thousands of patients of all races in my office over the years that poverty is actually a feeling. Now, Jamila talked a lot about um, politics and power. So I'm gonna get very small here. Poverty is a feeling. We think of it as the, all of the speakers have talked today um, of poverty as a number or an income level or a wealth figure or a Medicaid threshold or a policy target. But I would say one, the individual inhabits poverty. Poverty affects every decision, including medical ones. And since medicine is in the title of this symposium, I will come back to that. In fact, more than that, I would say that poverty is not simply reactive, but it's anticipatory. So what is this feeling? It's captured in one of my favorite studies. And the study goes like this. This is a Raven's progressive matrix test. You may have taken such a test when you were in school. It's a common component of IQ tests. And what the question here is, if you look on the top panel, um, is which of those options from one to eight below would fill in that panel? Now this kind of test requires no knowledge of world events or formal study or expertise. This is what measures what's called fluid intelligence, the capacity to think logically, to analyze and solve novel problems independent of background knowledge. Now, investigators in this particular social psychology study were interested in studying fluid 
intelligence. And so they took, and, and more than that, they were interested actually in, the, in, in income. So they took this study, they took this Raven's matrix into a mall and they approached strangers to participate in the study. And they asked a few intro questions, including their household in, uh, income. And then they asked uh, people in the study, what if your car breaks down and requires a $150 repair? You need to decide whether to get your car fixed or to take a chance that it can last a while longer. Financially, um, would this be an easy or a difficult decision for you to make? That's the question that got asked to hundreds of people in this mall. And what they found was when you divided people by self-reported household income into the median split between those who are rich and those who are poor, when you give them this question of $150 repair, you don't see any difference between income groups on a series of these Raven's matrices. Now, let's change the question that investigators said. And they said, what if your car breaks down and requires a $1,500 repair? And here what was found was that the higher income participants at the $1,500 threshold did exactly the same as the higher income participants did at the $150 scenario. However, the lower income participants did far worse at 1,500 than at 150. Now, that means that this money scenario, the investigators believe, and I believe, brings money to the front of the mind of the person who's participating. It causes a racket in the brain. Those with less money, simply by being asked to think of the car scenario, do worse on this test. They're preoccupied. The challenge of the payment became all too real to them in the moment. And what's remarkable to me about this simple study is how a person's cognitive capacity, as measured by this Raven's test, is affected. And we sometimes think of cognitive capacity as fixed, when in fact, it changes with circumstances. The same person performs worse when preoccupied by this idea of scarcity, or as one of the other speakers called it, deprivation, than when she is not. Her mental processor is slowed down by too many applications running in the background. And the poor appear worse because they have their bandwidth being used elf elsewhere. And that's what this $100 to $150 difference shows. Now, how much worse did they do on this test at $1,500? They did about 14 IQ points worse. That's like staying up all night and doing a test and before you go to sleep and then after not having gone to sleep for a day. These are dramatic changes. So the feeling of poverty is a feeling of scarcity. And a feeling of scarcity underlies what I think in the person that you see in front of you in an office is what we call stress. Now, what is this thing called stress? Well, we hear all the time that stress causes poverty and that poverty causes stress, that it's a circle. Mostly, I think poverty drives stress and not the obverse. And the best evidence for me for this is that the uh, socioeconomic status of a five-year-old predicts their health 20 years later. Again, money matters in the United States. The parents, SES, predicts that five-year-old's base cortisol level. So again, there's, there's stress, there's racket in the brain. There is a neurochemical price of poverty displayed here, such that, as we saw in the matrix test that we looked at, in terms of working memory tests, in terms of learning tests, in terms of impulse control and emotion regulation, you see that poverty has a price. That's the loop. What the price is, is a tax. And that, in economics term, is a tax on cognition. One does not have room for unexpected events, and the scarcity mindset is the setting for making extreme mistakes. And remember, when we think about the poor, they have no room mistakes. Now, poverty is relative. What we ask ourselves all the time is, how do I compare with others? And as with all taxes, that's the question. So I wrote a book describing some of these things called Broke, and thank you for putting on this panel in part due to the publication of this book. And here's what one of my patients said in the office. He said, I'm so broke, I have to rinse off paper plates. I'm paid on the first of the month, 
$723 in social security, 158 in food stamps. My rent is 222, 30% of my income, but that includes electricity. The building charges me $11 per month per air conditioner, and I need two. I keep an extra freezer, which I pay $6 a month for because I have 18 grandkids. I keep $200 bills in a safe and 157 in a checking account. I owe $55 a month on some furniture I bought, a curio with a, with a glass front where I keep pictures of my mother and my son who died. With anything left, I buy food to give away to people in the building whose money runs out before mine does. This is a book of voices, and this is one of the voices, one of the people that I call Perry in this particular book. Now, Perry's showing you a couple of things here. He's showing you that there are some buffers to poverty, right? Po that he has certain expectations. He knows what he's going to have at the end of the month. He has some social support. And these are buffers to poverty, not just with Perry, but with everybody else. Another person in this, in this book says the following. Poor? No, I live in the United States and I have running water and a bathroom. It's nice to get new things, but cars and phones don't mean anything. I have what I need to live. As a kid, we didn't have a dryer. My clothes were wet when I went to school. That was the only time I ever felt poor. So again, you see that this is about relativity. Um, people compare themselves even to themselves at an earlier age. So this notion of scarcity has both policy relevant um, importance and patient or medical importance. And I think these perspectives merge here and they teach us something. The diagnosis that I see in these patients in my office is less bandwidth. Let's call it that as a diagnosis. I don't know the ICD-10 code of that, but there it is. From a policy perspective, if you were running an organization out in the world, as some of my colleagues here do, um, when you see a lower income client arrive, you have to keep in mind that not only do they have less money, but they also have less bandwidth. So don't give them complicated obstacles or demands or paperwork. Look for ways to minimize hassles and reduce complexity. From a medical perspective, one-on-one, -on -one, we need as physicians and clinicians to be tolerant of lateness and even non-adherence. Cars break down, buses are unreliable, childcare is hard to find. In both cases, at the individual level and at the agency level, it is a profound misunderstanding to believe a person doesn't care if they don't perform in the ways that you think they should uh, behave. So the clinician must ask, what is poverty and its sense of scarcity doing to this person and what contextual factors are distorting their choices and actions? This is an important question we should be asking ourselves on a regular basis in offices around the country. And I'll end just by say, including this uh, historian Thomas Piketty's uh, note, which says, every human society must justify its inequities. Unless reasons for them are found, the whole political and social edifice stands in danger of collapse. That's the moment that we're in, whether you're looking at, at the patient level or the policy level. Thank you. What a wonderful conversation and set of presentations that we have heard today. Uh, for the next 20 minutes, we will be engaging in a conversation, and I encourage panelists to ask each other questions, too. I will serve as moderator and, and get us started. There have already been some questions from the audience, but the first one, I want to recognize that today is International Human Rights Day, and it, uh, it is important to recognize that poverty erodes many of the economic and social rights, the right to health, adequate housing, food, safe water, even political rights. And yet with COVID-19, we are expected to see 120 million people pushed into extreme poverty. And in the US alone, 8 million Americans have slipped into poverty since May. So many of you mentioned COVID in your presentations. I would like to hear from some of you on, on how are you adapting, especially those of you who are practitioners. And 
Philemon, maybe we can start with you because there was a specific question from the audience about the shift to telehealth and whether the Bowdoin Street Health Center has done that and if local residents are embracing the shift. Hi, thank you for the question. So um, what I will say is that um, the shift to telehealth is interesting because while we know that that is something that um, we're hearing from DPH that we need to do, we are hearing a lot from our patients that they want to come in, they want to be seen. Um, and considering we have many patients who are high risk um, and have many health complications, it's really hard to um, try to balance and, and figure out you know, which patients are the right patients to see in person because the idea is really keeping them safe. Um, one of the things that we, um, you know, I think um, Sunny touched upon and Jamila and others, we have all talked about the impact of, of uh, the pandemic. And what we saw for a lot of our patients uh, were a lot of food insecurity. Um, we worked a lot with many um, in uh, private funders who uh, wanted to figure out ways in which we could address the food insecurity issue. Um, as a health center, we did make a decision to um, have a testing tent uh, for our community. We were hard at hit and we started to realize that once our patients started asking questions about, you know, where do I go get tested? How do I get tested? It was more and more obvious to us that we needed to provide that as an opportunity to our patients. Um, and to date, we've conducted over 16,000 tests. And that's actually um, since we were open uh, in, back in the spring in April. April 16th was the day that we went live with our testing tent. And I remember thinking, wow, we've got 30 people. And then now it's like, whoa, we have about 200 people a day. So um, we're embracing it with the change and we're trying to address a lot of the needs that our patients have, um, um, both collectively and then on a case by case basis. You know, Natalia, if I can weigh in just a minute on COVID to say, you know, there are so many important sort of documented needs right now that are happening in terms of COVID. Um, and, you know, Philemon just spoke with one of, one of those. At Gutmarker, we actually have identified some changes that might last a generation, right? And um, there's, first of all, all the educational change. But women are making decisions that they want to delay pregnancy, that they want to have fewer children because of COVID. These are, these are a surveys that we were able to feel right now. We're hearing from them at the same time they're having trouble accessing, for many of the reasons that you're describing, they're having trouble accessing uh, birth control. They're trying, having trouble getting in for their sexual and reproductive health visits. And these are playing out on the, the inequitable lines that we've seen before. It, it tends to be uh, women of color who have expressed in greater numbers the desire to, de to defer uh, pregnancy and simultaneously are having trouble getting uh, the help that they need. People need to make decisions for themselves and their families right now, and they don't, they can't. Um, the last thing I would add, Natalia, is that um, one of the areas that we saw a huge or significant increase in our, in our health center is in mental health. Um, our behavioral health numbers, um, we were, I mean, I would say that that was the one area of, of health where we did not, where there were a lot of um, unkept appointments and now people are keeping their appointments. And I'm not sure if that's to, due to telehealth um, with the ability, I think it's a combination. It's with the ability of being able to have better access because all it is is a phone call away. Um, think about if you're depressed and you don't want to leave your home or you're afraid, all of these anxieties, but um, you don't have to go out into the elements. You can stay and be in the comfort of your own space and access those same services. And then lastly, um, um, we were getting a lot of referrals with people trying to manage and cope through uh, the pandemic. And so we've definitely seen an increase there. To, just to add to what Philemon's just said, you know, I spent the morning with the, the head of a health system who's, that had telehealth available in, in fully in gear a year before the pandemic started. It did not attract any clinicians. They couldn't get any clinicians to use it. So maybe the linings here is the jolting of the medical profession that certain things needed to change, that certain things needed to be done to provide access to people. And this system, you know, now has 90% of its clinicians.
physicians, at least some of its patients on telehealth. So there's a bit of a silver lining here if that persists and insurers continue to pay for it, et cetera, particularly for those patients who are able to use it. Now, not everybody can use it and access it, which is a separate issue, but those who can should, and the providers need to be able to help because it is convenient in many places. Can I, can I add quickly just the example of telehealth, uh, which tells us a lot about what can be done when there's a will to do it, right? So telehealth is, is not a new thing, right? But the scope of it um, has really expanded in an extremely limited period of time. And prior to COVID-19, there was a lot of discussion about the reasons why um, telehealth was hard to implement, the barriers to implementing it, the barriers through Medicaid, through Medicare, through health systems, um, some kind of aspects of health systems that were very resistant to the growth and expansion of telehealth. And what, what we saw in the wake of COVID was almost instantaneous change, right? And so, you know, one of the things to keep in mind is that when there is a will, there is usually a political and structural way. And I think that telehealth provides that example for us. And I always tell people next time you're told, well, that can't really happen or the system can't really accommodate that or that's going to take more time. Just remember COVID when we needed to, when there was a will and a demand, things happened, right? So we, but it's a matter of cultivating that demand without having to have a global pandemic killing hundreds of thousands of people in order to do so. If I could also just add, Natalia, really quickly in building on Jamila's point about what could happen. Um, so right after COVID, when the um, CARES Act uh, package was released by the federal government, it included expanded unemployment checks. And when you look at the housing impact, um, evictions came to a halt with the federal moratorium and the state moratorium on evictions. And then you had these unemployment, expanded unemployment payments that were being made to households and people paid their rent. They used those, uh, they used that income to pay their rent. And then uh, if you look again at um, evictions post moratorium and post all of those employment checks going away, they've again spiked. So if you think about universal basic income as a key way to keep people housed, keep them stable during a pandemic and into the future, I think that's one way for us to hit many um, social determinants um, in one swoop. Thank you so much. And there was a question that just came in around you know, the trade-off of income and health that, that, you know, you've talked about the trade-off in terms of being evicted, using it to pay for housing, that people often have to choose where to spend that money and maybe a basic income is where we should be going. But I want to take us even bigger than that. And maybe um, a question from the audience was, especially now, shouldn't public health be pushing reparations as a public health priority? Given that so many housing opportunities have been taken away due to intergenerational wealth extraction, the Homestead Act, redlining, Jim Crow, reparations seem like the only way to comprehensively move forward and anything less seems like patchwork over a larger wound. So Jamila, you spoke to power and how poverty is racialized and sort of not trying to do things at the margins, but going big. And Arminia, you also, noted that politics is nothing else but medicine on a larger scale. And I like to talk about the political determinants of health because I think that nothing is social, it is political. So how, you know, can we have a conversation around reparations that is centered in poverty, but recognizes the link between racism and poverty? And um, do you want to jump in first, Ramila? Sure. Um, you know, I think that's an important conversation for us to have. And and it's not the only conversation for us to have. So often when, when reparations emerges, uh, people will say, well, what about white people who are living in poverty? Do they not deserve relief, right? Look, I believe in basic human dignity. I believe that nobody should be living in poverty, including white people, right? And so reparations is not the only policy lever or policy approach, but just because it's not the only, it doesn't mean that it's not one and that it's not one that we shouldn't talk about, that we shouldn't censor, right? The other thing that folks often say in response to discussions about reparations is, well, it's just not politically feasible. It's not politically feasible. And in this moment in time, I fully agree. 
But that isn't the end of a conversation. That's the beginning of a conversation. Why isn't it politically feasible? What are what does this distribution of power relations look like that make it so far from possible? And how can we build power in which communities, in what ways? How can we strategically think about the political path between here and there? But in, often people think the feasibility question is the end of the conversation. Let's stop and let's look for solutions that are more feasible. Happy to do that in the short to medium term because people are suffering and they need relief sooner rather than later. But in the long term, it's worth thinking about what we need to put in place now to spark political feedback processes that get us to a point where things like universal coverage, universal, universal health care coverage, un universal basic income, reparations are real things. And reparations in particular um, are real possibilities. And rep reparations in particular, because the racial inequalities that we see in terms of wealth, in terms of income, in terms of material lived conditions will not go away unless we have policies that are targeted towards addressing um, racial, racial inequality and racial disparities. So, um, you know, I, I agree. And one of the things that I, so I started out thinking about Hurricane Katrina, right? So we often think about landfall in terms of the minus number, right? Hurricane minus 120 hours, minus 96 hours. Uh, people have gotten caught up in reparations as like one point in time, right? As if there was slavery and then think we're fine and we're here and you're gonna pay for something that happened 200 years ago. But we actually really can't move forward without really thinking about how do we restore centuries worth of, of political, right? Very intentional political and policy constraints on entire population, even laws that are seen as, as widely beneficial, right? The GI Bill, other bills, it is very clear that those were written in ways that systematically and intentionally excluded Black people. So you've got to think about, like, can you actually, what does a quote unquote level playing field, another sort of euphemism that people like to throw around, how do you, you know, what does a level playing field look like when, when people have been excluded over and over and over again? They weren't excluded once as enslaved people. They have been excluded with every policy, even policies that by and large provided a lot of social benefits and re reflected investments of taxpayer dollars into a public good. But a public good for the for without, you know, it's a public, not the entire public benefited from that good. So I think it, it really is an important conversation to have about remedying historical past as we think about the future. You can't just start from time zero and pretend the past hasn't happened. Thanks so much. Does anybody else want to jump in on the question of reparations? I do have several more from the audience, but if I, I'd love for anyone else who wants to jump in. Uh, I'd like to just say that um, it is something that we think about, especially in terms of home ownership, um, just given the deep systemic inequities that um, are built into the home ownership system, you know, where white households had the benefit of um, specific government policies that allowed them to become homeowners and then build generational wealth, send kids to college, help kids become homeowners that were denied, in particular, black house, to black households. And uh, one of the, the, Fair, the Fair Housing Act of 1988 prohibit discrimination. And um, what people in housing are trying to figure out is how do you um, think about housing as reparations and then how do you provide those reparations deliberately uh, to a specific group of people given the history, um, but also given that we're constrained by a Fair Housing Act that prevents discrimination. So can you really target a home ownership, affordable home ownership to black households, knowing that we can't really target housing um, uh, access to particular households. But there, you know, people are thinking about it. And I think that's where we just have to be really deliberate and um, 
make the case for this kind of very specific action towards uh, as a way of remedying and reparations. Thanks, Sonny. And there was a question from someone who works at a Boston-based um, anti-poverty nonprofit and sticks to the notion of power. Uh, the audience member says, the US partnership on mobility from poverty also stressed the importance of power. How can we measure power at the grassroots level when we are trying to help our program participants to break the cycle of poverty? I think this question was for you, Jamila, but I'd love Michael to jump in too, to talk a little bit about how the notion of scarcity um, at links at the individual level to the notion of power at the community level or beyond and and whether there is something that you know do, do these um sort of concepts speak to each other jamila Vanilla. you can go ahead if you have a have a measure at the of power at the grassroots level that they could help you know actually uh participants break the cycle of poverty by by measuring power at the grassroots level Sure, I'll be quick so that Michael can also jump in if, if he's able to, but um, I think these levels are sort of what people are experiencing at the individual level, what's happening at the community level, what's happening more largely at, you know, at the, at the state level with respect to policy, well, all of these levels are connected. Um, and, and measuring power at any level is hard, uh, but measuring it at the community level, I think, is especially promising. I, you know, one of the things I've been finding in a lot of research that I've been doing recently, um, and isn't anything new in fact, but I'm finding more and more evidence of it, and specifically with respect to organizing uh, for housing rights, um, is that power is often cultivated on the local level through grassroots organizations, membership-based organizations that play a role in building power. So one way we can begin to measure power is to measure and track the presence of those organizations, uh, the resources that those organizations have um, have access to, and the the membership bases of those organizations and activities of them, right? And that really connects the individual level to the local level because it's often um, power building community organizations that really reach into communities and identify individuals who are dealing with the scarcity that Michael pointed out for us, and who are often thinking about that scarcity on an individual level because it's difficult to sort of and outside of that and but organizations play a role in politicizing the issues for people and saying you know the reason why it's difficult for you to find a place to live isn't just because of you isn't just because you need to make more money it's because there's a housing market and it's structured by government policy and we can do something about that and so i would really look to community organizations as a locus of a sort of focus of measurement You know, my favorite Brian Stevenson quote of all of his great quotes is, you know, the opposite of poverty is not wealth, but justice. And you know, that the fact that, you know, we're a country that's built on the genocide of natives and the institution of slavery, and we don't acknowledge the unfairness that is continuously food. And the fact that we're obsessed with wealth through all of our literature and all of our politics is, you know, those are, those are connected ideas. I mean, I do, I, I don't know how to, uh, there are people on this, on this panel much better than I who can talk about sort of the, the grassroots organization of people who live in a state of scarcity. Uh, but I do think that in the end, you know, decisions are taken by voters and unfortunately in most cases, um, the fate of the poor is based on the decisions of the better off. And so I think we need to sort of change the culture of the better off. And, and I'm interested in sort of these mechanisms that people have been talking about here. Um, you know, it, it, to my mind, if we don't have to simplify it, either anger or shame, things are not going to get better. So how do we think about those, those um, you know, emotion laden terms in a cultural sense? All right, so we are running out of time, but I do wanna give Philemon a last word because I know you're building power at the community level through your health clinic and also um, um, anyone else, Dr. Palacio, uh, before I pass it back to Dean Galea, just 30 seconds though. 
Okay. So uh, what all I would like to say is that, you know, there are, um, there's power in voices. And as uh, Jamila talked about communities coming together, advocating for themselves, oftentimes we're finding that decisions are being made without the people who it impacts the most not being at the table. So as a community health center, we have whole team that is engaged and involved in the community and we do encourage them and spread the word um, when things are happening when they um, absolutely need to happen. Raminia, any last words? No, it's just uh, it's been wonderful to learn from my panelists. So thank you. Thank you so much for uh, a short but really, really great conversation. And Dean Galea, I will pass the floor back to you to close us out. Maybe we should pull him and put him back in. I realize I was, I was muted, I believe. Well, it is a time of Zoom when, uh, when uh, are you on mute seems to be uh, the coin of the realm. I apologize for that. What I was saying was thank you. Thank you to Natalia. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to all of you for being part of this conversation. I, uh, when uh, Professor Stein was speaking, I was reflecting on what he said about poverty being relative and about running water. And I read the other day that uh, half a million people in America's largest cities do not have access to running water. And that is today in 2020. And it seems to me like that gets at the heart of compassion. If we do not think that that is a public health emergency, if we do not think that that is something that public health should act on every day, I don't know what is. So thank you to everybody for being part of this conversation. I, I feel like our job in academic institutions is to have these conversations, to push these conversations forward, and to insist that they are addressed at all levels, at the community level, and at the level of policymaking and decision-making. This is how change starts. Everybody, thank you for being part of this conversation. Everybody stay safe, be well, and uh, if we don't talk before, have a good close and rest of the year. Thank you, everybody. Good evening.